Bom dia a todos. Eu me sinto enormemente feliz como presidente do Conselho do IBGC por abrir esse IBGC Conecta, que é um convite feito pela Secretaria de Governança, pela Comissão de Secretaria de Governança do IBGC, a nossa IAEL, e que hoje muda de nome essa comissão para a Comissão de Governance Officers. Eu acredito que esse webinar vai ser um marco para podermos alavancar ainda mais a importância da profissão de Governance Officer no Brasil. As expressões secretaria, secretaria de conselho, secretaria de governança, na verdade, derivam é, de uma tradução da função Company Secretary, uh, que foi introduzida primeiramente pelo Companies Act 1948 do Reino Unido, e que regulamentou o direito das empresas uh, atuantes naquele mercado e nos países componentes do bloco uh, da comunidade britânica. O termo secretário da empresa, entre aspas, é company secretary, é comumente usado no Reino Unido e em outros países da comunidade britânica. Já nos Estados Unidos, no Canadá, na Europa Oriental e estados que derivaram da antiga União Soviética, o termo secretário corporativo, o corporate secretary, é mais comum. Uh, um outro termo que é comumente usado uh, também é secretário do conselho, board secretary. Desde 2019, uh, essa nossa comissão no IBGC vem estudando a evolução do papel do profissional de governança nas diversas empresas. E nós aprendemos com eles o que é esperado, né? E isto é cada vez maior, é mais esperado, né? É, é, é cada vez mais esperado uh, que o governance officer forneça, tenha a capacidade de fornecer aos acionistas, aos conselheiros, aos diretores executivos e outras partes interessadas orientações sobre aspectos relacionados com a governança no curso das decisões estratégicas da empresa. Para cumprir essa função, é necessário que esse executivo, que muitas vezes reúne equipe de profissionais de governança altamente qualificados, e aí varia de empresa para empresa, esteja plenamente ciente dos poderes, dos direitos, dos deveres e das obrigações de cada um desses grupos de stakeholders. Além de fornecer é, aconselhamento e comunicação, propriamente dita, essa equipe de governança, né, liderada por um governance, chief governance officer, uh, frequentemente é chamada para criar Uh, e gerenciar relacionamentos entre esses diferentes atores ou agentes do sistema de governança corporativa. Uh, momentos em que, obviamente, entram atributos da inteligência socioemocional, comportamental, como, por exemplo, a empatia, como fator absolutamente importante para essa função. Não é? No entanto, mesmo diante de todos esses desafios e todas essas responsabilidades, a gente percebe que a nomenclatura ainda atrapalha uh, o empoderamento da, dessa profissão. O documento do AFC de 2016 sobre profissionais de governança menciona que, aspas, embora a função do secretário corporativo exista há mais de 100 anos, ela não é muito conhecida pelo público em geral. Muitos secretários corporativos contam histórias de terem sido confundidos com assistentes administrativos ou executivos 
em vez de alguém que desempenhe um papel profissional sênior na organização. No Brasil, essa confusão também existe na medida em que usava-se o termo secretária de governança e o termo secretária é mais entendido como sendo uh, assistente da diretoria executiva. Então, esse tipo de confusão existe e essa é uma das razões pelas quais essa comissão do IBGC, liderada pela IAEL, reestudou toda essa nomenclatura. Então, essa função e a própria área de governança de empresas que exercem as melhores práticas de governança corporativa se reporta diretamente ao Conselho de Administração e ao seu presidente. É um escudeiro do presidente. O IBGC acredita que a função de governance officer é absolutamente fundamental para o bom funcionamento da governança corporativa e, por isso, encoraja, encoraja que as empresas também adotem essa mudança de nomenclatura, que vai muito além do que uma simples troca de nomes, não é uma mera mudança vernacular. É um esforço para conscientizar o mercado sobre a relevância que este profissional possui para o bom funcionamento do sistema de governança nas organizações. A presença de um governance officer respeitado e até mesmo de uma área de governança sob sua direção é um sinal para o mercado de que a empresa leva a sua governança a sério e pode isso acarretar, inclusive, em, uh, no aumento da percepção de valor dos, por parte de seus stakeholders. Portanto, é, reitero a minha meu orgulho, a minha felicidade de estar aqui hoje abrindo esse evento e agradecendo em nome do Conselho de Administração do Instituto, do IBGC, pelos estudos realizados, pelos esforços enormes realizados pela comissão e reforço que nós acreditamos que a valorização dessa profissão contribui para aprimorar a governança corporativa e, com isso, colabora com os esforços para a construção de uma sociedade melhor assim como enunciado por nosso raison d'être, de nosso propósito, que é a construção de uma sociedade melhor por via da disseminação das melhores práticas de governança corporativa. Obrigado e um bom evento a todos. Lauren, I think now it's up to you. So you can, you can take the floor. Your phone, your mic, your mic. Great. Good morning. Um, thank, thank you very much. And, and firstly, I would just like to thank IBGC for inviting me to share my thoughts on this topic at this very auspicious time when you have made a significant decision, which I think continues the very important role that IBGC has played in the development of governance standards in Brazil. The late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is quoted as saying, generally change in our society is incremental. Real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. The action now taken by IBGC in confirming the importance of the role of Chief Governance Officer is such a step towards enduring change. A number of years ago, I, I penned a paper for the IFC titled The Company Secretary is Polymath to recall a polymath is effectively somebody who knows a lot about a lot of things. The article was intended to provide guidance to countries where the role of company secretary was either unknown or not fully appreciated. Its purpose was to highlight the multifaceted nature of the role, as well as the strategic nature of the role and its importance to the implementation of a sound corporate governance model. And lastly, and perhaps importantly in this instance, it was also aimed at distinguishing the role from that of the commonly used term for secretary, where one might envisage a typist pool from the 1960s in the 
taking of dictation. For context and to avoid confusion, I will just note that in my remarks, I'm likely to use the term company secretary and corporate governance officer interchangeably as we use both in the UK. And if I do use company secretary, please note that my comments equally apply to the important role of corporate governance officer or CGO. The profession of company secretary is formally recognized in many countries. And in a number of these, there has been a move to change the naming conventions to similarly ensure that the role is fully appreciated. This has happened in the past in the US and Australia, and more recently in the UK, where only last year, the UK Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators changed its name to the Corporate Governance Institute. It now also offers the qualification of Chartered Governance Professional. There are real merits to having a professional qualification and providing positive and focused teachings, but people come to this governance profession from many different walks of life. To add value, it is key that the individual has a good understanding of the legislative environment, as well as a strong leaning towards doing the right thing. So what has caused the evolution of the Chief Governance Officer or CGO role? Depending on the age of the audience, and unfortunately, I'm not able to fully appreciate that given this mode of delivery, but depending on where you are in your life story, you will sadly be able to relate to the term recent corporate governance scandal whether it be Enron or Lehman Brothers or more recently Wirecard, these types of scandals will and continue, will ha have had and will continue to lead to heightened scrutiny of business conduct, putting companies under pressure to promote transparency, disclosure and accountability. These types of scandals also lead to increased regulation. This, together with an emphasis on governance across all sectors and organizations, has propelled the demand for a skilled professional who can balance regulatory compliance with an organization's commercial interests and social purpose. The chief governance officer role and the importance with which it is viewed within an organization can also provide an indication to both internal and external stakeholders of the level of importance the board is placing on the value of governance, integrity, ethics, and sound business practices. Even though I liken the company secretary to Polymath in my article, this does not mean that the individual is an island or a one-stop shop. There are many other individuals within a corporate that have a vital role to play in governance, both at a board level and below. And the role that these individuals play may also impact the scope of the role of a particular CGO. It is important that you take my comments and those in the article, not as a one size fits all approach, but rather as a guide to the potentially all encompassing view of how a corporate governance officer can operate to ensure effective and sound governance practices. Now turning to the key role of the company secretary as it's evolved into corporate governance officer, I refer back to the forward in my paper where Professor Mervyn King noted, that although there may be variations on a company secretary's duties due to the jurisdictions in which they operate, statutes, or a variety of other reasons, it is to this individual that the board will look for guidance on its responsibilities and its duties. Company secretaries or corporate governance officers are in a, I beg your pardon, company secretaries are in a unique or natural position to take on additional responsibilities as corporate governance officers, linking into the board, the executive and stakeholders. In my paper, I refer to about eight different roles that the company secretary can play, all of which I think remain valid, even if in a slightly more evolved guise. Professor King noted three main areas of responsibility for the corporate governance officer. These being guiding the board members collectively and individually with respect to their duties and responsibilities, being that sound, wise, sage counsel. Secondly, ensuring that the company complies with all relevant laws and regulations, a basic compliance role. And lastly, probably more relevant to a new age company secretary is ongoing strategic communication between the company, its key stakeholders, to ensure that the board and management are informed about stakeholders' legitimate and reasonable needs, interests, and expectations. Now, a number of years, it's a number of years since I wrote the article, but these three core responsibilities remain key. And I would suggest that the other roles that I've outlined can hang off these. I'm not going to go through, you'll be happy to note, I'm not going to go through all eight roles, but I thought it would be useful to pick out some of the more key strategic functions of the CGO. Firstly, I'd like to touch on the role of the corporate governance officer as confidant or trusted advisor. 
This is a key differentiator for the profession from being a pure administrator. The CGO is uniquely positioned to take on the role to be that bridge between management and the board. Not only is the CGO a trusted advisor to the chair and the board, both individually and collectively, but they form a vital link between the board and the executive, creating a necessary bridge to ensure that both parties are able to fulfill their remit. As a result, it is critical that the CGO is an independent thinker who acts in the best interest of governance to do what is right. And as I'll highlight again later, this takes courage and can take courage in certain circumstances. Secondly, aligned to the role of trusted advisor is the need to be an educator and governance leader. I think that this particular role has taken on great importance with the passage of time. The need to stay ahead of the game is a survival tool, both for the corporate governance officer and board members. I have on occasion joked with my teams when trying to anticipate the needs of various stakeholders, including board members, that perhaps a fully functioning crystal ball might be a useful piece of equipment in which to invest. But jokes aside, with the pace of change, both from a stakeholder and regulatory perspective, it is vital that the corporate governance officer is engaged in the external environment to ensure that they are aware of the changing landscape. Keeping an eye on the horizon and with that knowledge to ensure that the board is staying up to speed on developments that may impact the entity's operations, its information needs are properly being properly met and this will be seen in the papers that are presented to the board for consideration. There's also an important role to play in emerging governance issues, whether it be cybercrime or artificial intelligence. Another key area which is very topical at the moment is ESG, which is important regardless of the sector in which you operate. So if we look at ESG, for instance, if we look at particularly at the E or environment, it's interesting to note that a number of studies have shown through the crisis, through the pandemic, the companies with stronger ESG strategies have proved more resilient. Both regulators and stakeholders have heightened their focus on the environment through the pandemic. Investors are interested in how companies are responding in terms of safety, logistics, and operational continuity. And there's potentially more regulation in the space, which means more obligations and more compliance for boards, and the needs for boards to be aware of both current and potential obligations. The emerging financial risks associated with climate change have accelerated the need for boards to be suitably educated. The basic duty of care required from directors in any jurisdiction may lead to an increasing number of actions being taken against them for not considering this risk. The corporate governance officer has a role to play in both in ensuring that the board is well educated in the space and also that in ensuring that these matters are properly placed before the board in its deliberations. Keeping up to speed with the plethora of developments in the space is daunting. There is a lot going on, but you can be resourceful in your approach. There are lots of resources available online. In relation to climate change, I would note the work being done by a relatively new organization called Chapter Zero, which was established under the auspices of the World Economic Forum's Climate Governance Initiative. It's geared towards chairmen and directors of companies and it has a focus on how board directors can better oversee their company's climate transition strategies. The website has useful resources and a toolkit that can aid in training of directors. I'm not, uh, this is not a commercial for chapter zero, but I'm just trying to point out to, to the audience that there are resources online that can help you in doing this education if you are um, in a small team and, and doing the role on your own. Another way in which corporate governance officers are playing a role as a bridge is in relation to stakeholders and ensuring the voice of the stakeholders heard. Now, this is potentially a whole nother topic for a whole nother day around the emergence of stakeholder capitalism and the move away from shareholder primacy. It's an interesting debate. Um, and I think probably one that is, is, is very current, bearing in mind that it's 15 years, 50 years since the anniversary, 50 year anniversary, since Milton Friedman proclaimed that a corporate social responsibility is only to its shareholders. There is a growing view both in legislation and through actions of corporates, particularly seen through the pandemic, that entities need to take account of stakeholder interests, whether that be employees or regulators or others. The corporate governance officer has a role to play in ensuring papers presented to the board capture stakeholder considerations. You don't need legislation on this to start thinking about where the decisions being placed before the board take account of the impact on your stakeholders. How have these been taken into account or any engagement that may have occurred? All of this goes to enrich the governance around matters placed before the board. 
Now, having pointed out some of the more strategic aspects of the corporate governance officer role, um, I think it's also important not to lose sight of the couple of the key more business as usual. I'd hate to use the word mundane, but I'd rather use business as usual aspects of the role that also play an important role in the quality of decision making and how these decisions are recorded. Now, obviously the term secretary, company secretary comes from somewhere and I think key still is the role of the scribe, that is the one who takes the minutes, the one who records the meetings. Now, although this sounds like a menial task, it's a really important role. Taking good minutes is an art. In order to be able to capture the essence of a discussion and the nuanced comments or challenges raised, you need to have a deep understanding of the business and the issues being discussed. Good minutes are not a verbatim repetition of what has been said or of what is in the papers. But what you may need to produce may differ between forums and purpose. I'm not going to give you a lesson on minute taking, but I do think a good understanding of who the audience is for your minutes is key. Who are you writing them for? How might they be used? Is it for management? Is it for regulators? How might they be used in the future? Do they correctly capture the tone and challenge presented at the meeting? Will a reader in the future be able to understand what was being discussed, how decisions were made without having access either to the underlying papers and without um, the papers themselves being repeated within the content of the minutes? It's not an easy task and one that takes lots of practice. Another critical role for the corporate governance officer and, and probably more importantly is also the quality of papers. I think this is quite fundamental to the quality of board discussion. And if you're looking at the quality of board discussion, you're also looking at the impact on the quality of board decisions. Maybe more impactful where you have truly independent non-executive directors because these directors are in a difficult position. Those directors who are not involved in the day-to-day -day management of a company are at a slight disadvantage. They reliant on management for their information needs. The corporate governance officer plays a vital role in bridging this asymmetry of information by ensuring that the right matters find their way to the board for deliberation and that papers are appropriate positioned to ensure that these matters are heard by the board and can be properly deliberated. I think that the quality of papers also relates to both form and substance. Now, saying the form of, pa pa the form of papers may be surprising as you may question and suggest that surely it's the content that is key. I will say that experience has shown me that a great paper poorly presented is unlikely to be as well received as the same paper presented in a more aesthetically pleasing way. That is human nature and that's actually key to being a professional as well. It's also human nature to take comfort from things that are familiar. And with board packs, knowing your way around a pack gives a sense of comfort. So for example, consistency in presentation is important. Use the same font, use the same format for presentations. It may all seem trivial, but it has a really big impact on the reader and the reader's experience when they engage with a board pack. In addition, although the actual structure and how you present board papers may differ from organization to organization, a lot will be gained from discussion and the reader's engagement with the paper if you have a clear roadmap for the reader. Set out very simply and very briefly, what is the purpose or context of the paper? Why is it being presented? What do you want from the forum? Are you asking them to review it or approve it or merely use it to inform future thinking? Also, how can the board get comfort with it? What is the process that has followed? Who's reviewed it before? What path has it traveled? Once a reader has a clear, and also I would also suggest including an executive summary as well, especially for longer papers. Once a reader has a clear picture in their mind of what they're supposed to be doing with the paper, it makes it more digestible. And the length of paper is key. I have never known a director to complain that papers were too short. There are always too many papers for directors to read and usually in too short a time frame. I think it's a CGO's role to ensure that the size of papers is managed. Again, like with minutes, it's easier to write a lengthy paper, throwing in everything, but a well-reasoned paper is so much harder to master. One that draws out the critical issues for the board, rather than expecting them to identify what the issues are in an information dump. And this is where the corporate governance officer has a key role to play, not just around the board table, but ensuring that the right information is placed before the board. Then in relation to both the quality of information provided to the board and the bridging role to be played, the corporate, officer, corporate governance officer can play an important role in relation to the management team. 
One tends to view the company secretary role as a service provider to the board. But in order to best serve the board, there's also a need for end-to-end -end governance. Now, end-to-end -end governance should be a clear objective to enable a clear flow of information from the business through to the board. In order to ensure that this as, is as effective as possible, the Corporate Governance Officer can help management to shape their governance practices so that they are seamless with those of the board. This would include providing clarity on such things to management as what are the board's expectations and what is the timing for delivery so that management processes and management can prepare sufficiently in time for the board. Although seemingly simple, this helps to ensure that the quality of information presented to meet, meets the board's information needs in both a timely fashion and in a way that enables better decision making. I would also note that in addition, obviously we are focusing here on the name change to Corporate Governance Officer, but I would also note that the naming convention is in itself empowering, but it is also useful for the Corporate Governance Officer to be positioned for success in an organization. How the Corporate Governance Officer's position can be key to ensuring that they are sufficiently empowered, as well as to ensure that their role within the organization is given the right status or that it has a proper voice at the table. I've seen many different models for reporting lines, all of which may work in different countries or corporations. What remains key is that the Corporate Governance Officer is suitably empowered to be independent and to be given unfettered access to key role holders and stakeholders. This will enable the individual to truly act as the guardian of governance. And finally, although I have mentioned some key attributes in my remarks, I thought I would finish off with some of my top five characteristics needed to be a Corporate Governance Officer. Now, quite clearly, I would be remiss if I didn't say my first one was being a polymath. That remains key. The breadth of topics on which the individual needs to be aware remains a distinguishing feature of the role and hopefully a unique selling proposition to encourage and attract a new guard of professionals to take on the role. Secondly, I would say an inquisitive or curious mind. The role is not static. Again, a potentially unique selling point for young professionals. It is ever it is ever evolving and a thirst for knowledge, both current and future state is a great attribute. It's not boring, it changes and it changes with regulatory developments, it changes with the context, it changes with the economy. It's a hugely interesting and rewarding role from that perspective. Thirdly, I think being a skilled communicator and having the ability to build relationships is key. The message is such an important part of the role and in so many ways from the writing of papers to engaging with stakeholders to forming that bridge between the board and the executive. The fourth point I would raise is courage. I have, I have said courage before, but I think it's worth saying again, it's definitely not a popularity contest. And sometimes the corporate governance officer is the voice that nobody wants to hear. Sometimes what you recommend may not be the easy path, but it should be the right path. Doing the right thing is key to ensuring a strong governance system. And finally, because all of this sounds so terribly serious, I think my fifth point is that you need a good dose of humor. Things don't always go according to plan and you've got the have to have the ability to be flexible and roll with the punches. So I think it's important that you build relationships, but it's critical as well that in doing so, you take people along with you so that they see the value of governance. In concluding my remarks, I just wanted to thank again, IBGC for inviting me. Um, uh, congratulations on this is a bold move. I look forward to seeing the progression of the role, the Chief Governance Officer's role in Brazil. Um, and I also look forward to the debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Guys, I, I made a mistake. I didn't present our panelists, so I will do it now, okay? Because everybody knows everybody here, but anyhow, it's my role to do that and I didn't do it. So Lauren just, just gave us a wonderful speech. She is a senior partner and head CEO and board services and financial services. I'm so sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. She's the global head policy and stakeholder engagement, corporate governance and secretary of HSBC, correct? And she has wonderful papers in this matter. Uh, Jorge Malucci, he is a senior partner and head CEO and board services and financial services practices South America at Corn Ferry. And last but not least, Charles Creek. He is a chairman and CEO at KPMG Brazil and South America. Okay. And myself, I'm Aaron, and I'm 
a board member at IBGC, okay? So before I, I pass the word to, to Jorge and to Charles, uh, just one remark, Lauren. You know, I am a very, I, I love basketball. And I think that the guy, that the person you are describing is something like Michael Jordan, or maybe LeBron James, or, or maybe Kobe Bryant, something that level. S such a high standard, not easy to find, not easy to find. So with this, I'll pass to Charles. Please, Charles, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much, Aaron, and uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And um, as Lauren, I would like to thank ABGC for the invitation. It's a great opportunity to discuss something that is evolving uh, every day more. And uh, of course, it's a pleasure to be here with Lauren, with George, and with you, Aaron, to, to make reflections about, I think, the evolution from the corporate secretary to the governance officer. And, and uh, I, I, I really loved uh, uh, Lauren uh, uh, start here because I think uh, there are two, two fundamental uh, uh, aspects here in this discussion. The first is the, the evolution of the task of the role of the board secretary or governance officer and uh, uh, the, the, what the activities uh, that this LeBron Jordan has to do her on. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I think there is a real, uh, and sorry, Lauren, uh, to, to say that, but uh, we have a fruit here in Brazil that is called Jabuticaba. And there is no other place in the world that we have this fruit. So it's, it's a really very, very Brazilian thing. And uh, the, the, the discussion about the name can be really not that important or other else. Uh, in the world, but here in Brazil, yes, because the secretary can be understood as, as, a, as a different thing that we are discussing here in the role that you so, so really wonderfully described. Uh, uh, I, I made some notes here when I was preparing myself to this, this debate, uh, uh, things that uh, uh, are worth for reflection. And the first would be the evolution of the, the role, the second, uh, how, how would we say that this task or this role is efficient uh, in, a, in a company? Uh, I tried to, to put together some data about this role in Brazil. And I um, uh, uh, would like to talk a little bit about the format. And one thing that we always discuss is, does one size fits all? Uh, I, I, I really would like to put some ideas here. And last but not least, talk a little bit about the resistance to this role, because uh, it, it seemed to, to us here, of course, and, and I'm sure for uh, the executive and, and, and everybody that is seeing us today, the importance of this role, but we still see some resistance in the market, uh, uh, probably because people don't understand the role or uh, 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 maybe it's related also to the maturity of the governance uh, in, in uh, some of the, the companies. So talking a little bit uh, about evolution, what we see very clearly, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, we are moving forward in terms of recognizing the importance of the secretary of the board of the governance officer. Um, I think uh, uh, there are still some places where the secretary or the assistance of the CEO has also this role or simply, uh, and, and don't get me wrong with the simply, but uh, 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 the, the general counsel of the, the company does this role. And sometimes this role is seen as, as just the, the, the person who writes the minutes of the board meetings and so on. And I, I, I love what you described, Lauren. And I think we are talking here about something that is much more important and much more complex than just that. We are talking here about someone that helps the board to organize the agenda, to do the follow-up of the issues that have been discussed in terms of governance. Uh, assure, and, and you know what? One thing that I always hear from board members and being myself also a member of, of some boards is how 
early I get the information that will be discussed in the board meeting. Uh, sometimes we get the information five minutes before. So, uh, uh, and I, I'm maybe talking about really very simple things, but that makes a huge difference when you have a, a, a really good discussion in the board about uh, uh, really important things. So, uh, uh, assure that information get to the board members with the right uh, 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 timing. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, uh, really know the business, uh, the risks of the business, the challenges, the opportunities. Uh, uh, I think uh, assure that the board is really discussing in the right uh, that uh, uh, the, the important things that uh, the board has to discuss. And so I see the governance officer or the secretary of the board uh, 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 beside everything that you described in Iran, I think we are talking probably something more than the, the LeBron or the Jordans, but uh, this is what we expect. And, and I, I will talk a little bit about the, the challenges. And uh, one thing that we will probably have to deal with, and I'm so happy that we have the IBGC here with all the, the course, the training is, uh, how we together prepare these professionals to take over a role such uh, 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 this, because I, I really don't believe that we have, and, 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 and Lauren, probably not just in Brazil, but in other places as well, someone that is fully prepared to take over a role like this. And so part of the training, part of the evolution uh, of the efficiency of this role is really uh, we recognize that we have to prepare those professionals to take over this role. Uh, talking a little about the uh, ef efficiency, I think uh, uh, Enrique touched at the beginning that uh, the organization chart or the hierarchy uh, uh, around this role is for me very important. So responding directly to the board or to the chairman of the board for me is fundamental. Uh, I'm not saying that um, other, other models are not efficient or, or will not work. But I think this person, as you said, this is not a popularity contest. Uh, this person has to feel free to make the tough calls, to, to have the, the, the really candid conversations, uh, both with the executives and with the board. And so uh, independence, hierarchy, uh, where in the organizational chart this person is located for me is also very important. Uh, and, and when I was collecting some information, uh, uh, and I don't know if this is, is a trend outside of Brazil or in, and maybe around we can discuss this in the debate, we are seeing a lot of companies taking the decision of outsource this function. So taking really someone that is a, a specialist in the market, in the segment that this company is acting, and having an outsider uh, uh, playing this role. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, probably positive aspects of outsourcing this, and, and I'm sure that are other that can be seen as not so ideal, but uh, this is certainly a trend that we see in the marketplace that uh, you have the governance officer outsourced or someone with a consulting, uh, let's say, role playing and, and doing this. So in terms of data, uh, as you can imagine, we don't, we don't have uh, right now organized data and uh, 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 we are trying uh, in our organization KPMG to do something like this. But uh, uh, I'm very happy to see there are a lot of recommendations. Now, the first, uh, we have the governance code from the IBGC. Uh, and this is, this is something very, very important. We have some private equities uh, uh, also doing recommendations about this role. We have the IFC, we have the OCDE doing this. And then all of these papers, recommendations, instructions, they, they have uh, in, a, in a good manner, uh, maybe if you take uh, all and, and, and all the articles we, we have available, if you take all together, you have a really very good uh, 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 instruction or recommendation on how to, to, 
uh, organize this role. Here in Brazil, the Brazilian SEC, which is called the CVM, they issue a instruction that is the 586. Uh, and, and this instruction uh, has, I don't know how, how, the, how I, I express this in English, but is practice or explain something like this you know, uh, about the, the uh, uh, adherence of the company to the Brazilian code of uh, governance. So uh, the, that the EPGC, uh, of course, helped to, to, to put together. And what is that? Uh, the, the company has to explain uh, uh, whether or not the, the board, the committees, and the secretary of the board are uh, uh, effectively evaluated during the year. And if yes, how? If no, why? So practice or explain. And I think this will help us in terms of evolving in this role. Uh, we see every day more that this role here in Brazil, and mainly, of course, in the public listed companies, you, you see this role evolving and, and moving from, let's say, a minute maker to, to someone with a greater responsibility. And one thing that is interesting that I, that I saw in, in, in the research, the small research I did here, is that a lot of private owned companies have governance officers. And this is so interesting because the, I think the recognition from uh, uh, the, uh, in the journey from a family-owned business to a more formal business, uh, these private-owned companies uh, are taking decisions like put the family in the board, not in the, the, the C-level anymore. And since they are in the board, really have a proper board with corporate governance officer and so on. So. Uh, we see a trend of private uh, uh, companies organizing uh, itself and, and having uh, the secretary of, of the board and the governor officer in the same way as the public listed one. So uh, really very quick about uh, data. Uh, another thing is one size fits all. And, and hearing you, Lauren, I think confirm what uh, I put here as ideas. Uh, I think the first idea is it doesn't matter the size of the company, uh, the responsibility of the board remains the same. So I think, I think this, this is one thing that I believe is fundamental. So if I'm, if I'm in a company that has billions and billions of revenue, of if, if I'm in a company that has uh, just some millions, uh, if I'm a board member, I have the same responsibility. And having said that, maybe the size and the profile of this professional may be different. So, and, and uh, uh, this comes uh, to me to one size does not fit all. So I think uh, having a, a governance officer in all companies is of course and for sure something that is highly recommended, but maybe the structure and the profile of this professional may change may change connected to the size of the company, how many committees, how many organs of governance this company has, how complex is the product or the services, how geographically spread this company is, how many branches or how many structures uh, this company has. Because uh, uh, with this complexity, the governance, the governance will be more complex. So the role will be more complex as well and more important. So in my opinion is uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean for me uh, uh, in terms of the necessity of having a governance officer the size of the company, but the complexity of the role, the profile and the size of this, uh, let's say governance office not officer is is dependent on the complexity of the company. So some reflections here about that, and and maybe last but not least, Aaron, and to stay uh, in 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 really the timing uh, to for us to hear George and, and have a nice discussion. Uh, I I made some thoughts about resistance. Uh, 
No? And uh, what, I, what I came here to the conclusion for us to reflect is first, I think the resistance is completely connected to the maturity of the governance. Uh, I, I, I came to the conclusion that it doesn't matter at all. We should not expect that someone is simply against a governance officer. I think uh, this, this well, it, it may happen, but it, it, it's unlikely uh, that we will see that. But in the journey of having a proper governance, uh, if you are less mature, probably you will place less importance in the governance officer. And, and if you're highly mature, you will place more. And I, see, I think also the second is connected to the the discussion here of how prepared this person is, how how Jordan or how LeBron this person is. Because if you have someone that simply does minutes of meetings and uh, has no communication skills and no seniority, probably there will be resistance because this office will be seen as a cost, not a, as a benefit for the company. So I think uh, two connections. The first is the maturity of the governance in the company and also the profile and the size uh, 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 of this person uh, uh, in executing uh, 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 his or her role in the company. So, uh, and, and as I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic, normally I, I always try to see the, the, the glass half full, uh, I would say that uh, we will see less and less resistance going forward than, than not. And, and I think having this discussion here is another sign that uh, we are moving forward in terms of having the right person and the right structure in the companies. So, Ron, this, this Thank was you, Charles. Oh, well, the you. ideas that I had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Now I'm going to pass to the floor to Mr. George. Thank you, Aaron. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this note discussion. It's an honor to actually to, to share this virtual stage with such a number of political colleagues in, in such a, I would say, important moment in the in, in improvement of governance in, in, in our country. Well, my, my contribution today actually is based on experience from working you no know, serving boards in Brazil, right? Uh, both recruiting for such position and also uh, from board assessments that we regularly do you know, for several companies. And, and these board assessments are important as experiences because uh, of the relevance and the impact that the functioning of the governance support has in terms of the effectiveness of the board. Uh, Good, good decision is based on no good information. And uh, one of the, I think the roles is more important of a disposition currently is actually to assure that you no, know, the, the adequate information is provided timely to the board, but it's not just this. Uh, my take is that boards are, boards are evolving in Brazil. We will not have a situation where the boards are already you know, completely developed, and now we are starting to develop a, a, a new position. Uh, boards are evolving. Boards are being more protagonists in the companies. Boards are be, being more engaged, right? And board, boards being more responsible, right, uh, in, in the companies in Brazil. And given this evolution, actually, the demand for the enhancement of this role actually is, is, is a natural consequence. So as the boards uh, are demanded to be more active, to meet more, to actually board, be more in charge of you know, several things in the company that in the past were not as the, the same because boards for several years in Brazil, uh, given you know, the corporate structure, the ownership structure, used to be more, I would say, a performer, you no know, uh, collegiate. The decisions were made by the owners of the companies and, and the boards are quite of a, just a, a kind of a, of, a, of a regulation requirement only. Uh, this changed. 
and, and, and this change is actually becoming you know, uh, more complex. And but when you see the companies in Brazil, we, as uh, Charles mentioned, we see companies in different stages of maturity in the boards and also uh, in the perception of the value of this position. And the way this position is, uh, is actually perceived and, and, and how rich they are. And what you see in, in several companies yet is, you know, uh, this is a not a, a, a full-time job. This is you know, a, a, a role that is it, it regularly you know, shared with the you know, uh, legal department, with the general counsel of the company, with the perception that most of the, you know, the responsibility requ is required to you know, write the minutes, uh, assure the proper legal language is, is, is established in, in, in the documents and, and things like that. Uh, others companies have you know, a, a fully dedicated full-time position and even a department you know, uh, dedicated to the governance uh, aspect of the company. And, but, but sometimes what we see is that this has a, a kind of a... Uh, it, this department is overwhelmed with other roles. So it, it, they just not support the, the board, but they support every you know, single meeting in the company. They support you know, the executive committee, executive forums, and things like that. It, it's not, and this actually you know, drains uh, energy and drains resources from these people. And regularly these departments are, are very small, uh, under-resourced, I would say. And, and in companies, other, other companies, you know, we, we have, you know, I would say, the proper organization. We have, you know, a dedicated department with, you know, uh, a senior guy leading this and actually performing what they expected to perform, supporting the board, supporting the, you know, uh, the committees of the board, uh, right hand of the chairman and things like that. So saying that, uh, what we still see now, in, in, in these you know, different sets of, uh, of scenarios are that in many cases, this position is yet you know, subordinated to the CEO uh, and others had already evolved to have this subordinated to the proper level that is at the board or, or to, to the chairman. Uh, and when, when we perceive and we think about the the three main roles that are expected from, from, from this position, uh, I would say a full governance officer. Uh, what to say is that when you think just about the support to, to directors, kind of a, a secretary or concierge uh, role, right? Schedule meetings, typewrite minutes, you know, provide catering to meetings, you know, book hotels and flights for directors, things like that. I think this is the best already. I think the companies that are more involved are already, you know, done with this. This is maybe it's part of this, this role, but it's not, you know, the main uh, characteristic of this, of this role. Then we evolve to, I would say, a process management role. And I think this is the current stage we are in Brazil. And, and the most developed companies are still actually developing in this stage. So, it, 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 the role is expected to prepare and distribute, you know, support information. Is still prepare and distribute, not yet to to make it the, the creation of this information. I right? see so this is a as a next stay, step. Uh, coordinate executives presentation, interface with the services of providers of the board, for instance, you no know, lawyers, consultants. Um, coordinate the agendas of board and committees, uh, follow up with management, you no know, filling governance indexes forms and things like that. Uh, so I think this is still evolving uh, at the Brazilian boards, Brazilian companies. I think that uh, when, when you think about this process management, have more power, uh, having more, I would say, authority in the process, actually driving more, you know, the management, driving more, you know, even directors, uh, 
giving a, a say in terms of you know the content of the the, the the agenda of the meetings of the annual agenda i'd say this is, is still evolving i think this is uh, something that is, is starting to be demanded to, to this position but sometimes it is demanded but the authority to do this is not yet there so there's a kind of a of a conundrum here and I, I think this is a question of maturity this is evolving uh, most of our you know board assessments identifies this issue and actually points that this is a point you have to you know, empower the secretary of governance or the secretary of the board still this name is, is used right to actually be able to to get this done so uh, and also to assure that the, the proper topics are you know, uh, presented, are in place in the schedules and in the you know, agendas of the meetings and in the annual calendar of the company. And actually make the follow up with the chairman that this is actually being, you know, uh, having the proper attention and have the proper priority, right, uh, during the discussions. I think that we are not there, and I think this is will be, you know, a, a leapfrog uh, that is actually making this position, I would say, a, a governance enabler. Actually, what Lauren said, right, is actually uh, someone who will actually make the bridge well, between board and management, actually. Uh, prepare the new directors onboarding, right? Prepare governance trainings, uh, assure you know, proper compliance with best practice, provide advice on you know, potential conflicts of interests, you know? uh, assure regulatory compliance, you know? uh, conduct the proper communication you know? uh, among, between the company and key stakeholders. This is not yet, you know, a, a role that is perceived that is a, a kind of a, a, a role to, to, to this position. And maybe the proper you know, creation of information actually assure that, as Lauren said, uh, the proper information is provided to the board, unbiased information and comprehensive information, right? Not just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages, right, of, of, of documents that actually you know, overwhelms the directors with the useless information, but actually the proper, accurate, objective information, unbiased information, relevant information that you provide you know, the directors with the condition to you know, uh, find the, the best decision to the, to the company. I think this is in the future yet. And I think that this change uh, is what will represent the, the most challenging change in terms of the profile of this professional. When we think, see things like that, when we see responsibilities like that, you know, uh, associated with this position, we can almost say that this, uh, the, who, the, whoever actually assumes this role needs, first of all, a very qualified team you know, behind him, uh, him or her, uh, a very, very good seniority and experience and gravitas to actually to make all these stakeholders, you know, uh, respect and actually attend to, 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 to his or her demands. And as Charles mentioned, I think this may be a, a point of resistance and not because it is a relevant perception or a perception of irrelevance that creates costs, but it's a perception that this is a role that is actually actually restraining others' roles, right? Because this will actually demand executives more. It, they, it demands, I would say, uh, the chairman more, it will demand you know, directors more. Uh, and actually, you know, uh, put, I would say, uh, more consistency you know, in, in, in the whole process. Uh, I would say that today companies in Brazil are not ready for this and, and most of the professionals that are in the positions are not there. I'd say that, that we are almost talking about a kind of a, what is expected from an independent director in, in, in such you know, uh, space. 
And, and even when we are asked to, you know, in our board assessments exercise, to include the assessment of the secretary, uh, these aspects related to improvement of governance, these are not yet, you know, in, in the, I would say, concerns of the board to, to be. It's more related to, to the quality and to the supporting processes, you know, the proper technology platform, you know, information sharing and, and, and things like that. And, and currently, this governance enhancement responsibilities are split between, you know, or among, you know, the independent directors, uh, the chairman, uh, sometimes, you know, the governance committee, when there is a, a governance committee in, in the company, the communication with stakeholders, uh, a, a big part of this is actually delegated to the uh, investors' relations, but, but not to, to the you know, uh, governance officer yet. So I think this is, is something that we have to evolve. It's, this is something we, we, we need actually to, to improve. And I think this is the responsibility of, this, you know, of these people to actually to, to show they are able to do this, they need to do this and actually to uh, make the board awareness that this kind of support and this kind of roles will be actually facilitated their lives a lot, right? And when you think about the different types of companies, I, I think that the more the company actually uh, evolves to a corporation mode with no, no, no clear controllership, I think the more relevant is the role because actually it provides a sense of continuity, you know, between the several terms. They are able actually to understand better what happens inside the company, because, you know, he leaves the company, and, and, and I'd say assure the, in the, the directors, most of, that there are independent directors, like almost for, you know, by definition, uh, has, you know, not biased information. There are no, no, you know, hidden aspects uh, that boards are not aware of. So the, the, I think the responsibility and and and, and the, of this role actually increases significantly to the governance and and something that the, the, the directors should value, you know, uh, very very the most. So saying that, I think that. We, we, we change significantly the requirements for this for this professional. Uh, currently, is some when we are asked to actually to hire people for this position, what companies ask us is someone that is very disciplined, very strong organizing skills, you know, uh, a very good of under of governance best practices, you know, uh, good process manager, you know, attention to details. Right, someone who is able actually to listen and to serve different stakeholders. Okay, what will be required in the future uh, as soon as this position you know, uh, evolves in the companies is seniority and gravitas. Someone who will be able actually to talk you know, in equal terms with directors, who is you know, the, the senior manager of the company. Uh, strong knowledge about, you know, uh, regulation on society and capital markets, uh, strong communication skills, you know, strong business perspective as well, uh, influence and skills, independence, you know, ability to build trust, good ability to understand, you know, people's actual intents in order actually to avoid it to be, you know, uh, manipulated uh, in the process, someone very rigorous, and at the end of the day, is is actually a, 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 almost a, a director like you know set of you know skills. So uh, this is my take. I think this is what experience you know showed me in the in the recent past, and I, I really believe that you know the evolution of this role will be. Uh, a, a strong, you know, uh, yeah, to throttle to, 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 to the governance of our companies and for Brazil. So thank you all. And I think now we'll be open to the discussions. Here thank on. you so much, George. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, For you want to make some comments on those two speeches? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, 
I, I think I agree with 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 a lot of the content of, of of what was said. I think um I think sort of working in reverse. I think what George was saying around sort of the qualities that are needed, those that are needed now, and those that are needed in the future. I think I think is quite key. I think all of those things are key to bring the essential parts of the role, the discipline, the strong organisational skills, um, and the challenges that you see. And I'm I'm not surprised in an environment where the role isn't accepted that it's something that you see coming up in board of evaluations in that there's a need for it and 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 I think that's probably um it probably speaks to you where you say the current maturity of where that where the role might might be in in your environment um and and I think maybe just picking up on on a couple of Charles's comments as well I think that um I think both of you sort of allude to the fact that a lot of it depends on the complexity of the organization and and value and I, and I agree I couldn't agree with you more I think I think that um to some extent, success breeds success in, in, in the circumstances. Until people have seen the value of the role and can appreciate it, they will, there is potentially resistance. It takes a little bit from in you know different types of roles. You, 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 you can potentially be stepping on toes, um, but it does create that additional discipline where you're asking more of, of the parties involved to get to that state of better governance. So yes, there may be resistance in the beginning, but, but what I should have said that in addition to all those skills, um, I used to say, from from a South African context, you need a, a skin like a rhino because you need to be tough. And, and, and I think that's also quite a key characteristic of a company secretary is um, I don't think you need to be bullheaded and dogmatic. I don't think those are good qualities, but I do think it's, it's, um, it is that tenacity to, to get to where you want. Just my last comment before Aaron, before you move on to other questions is, is I would say there's almost a converse need for the level of skills and the, the breadth of skills that required in more complex organizations that are better maybe resourced, chances are your, your governance officer will have fewer roles to play in that there will be potentially a tax expert, a, um, you know, obviously a legal compliance expert who who bolster the governance system. Where, where you see essentially, and this is where I guess it, it, it's a bit counter- it's counter to, to thinking is that in a small organization is where you need that individual that actually can play all those roles because they won't necessarily have the support and the complexity. So they will have to be able to be flexible and provide that additional support that maybe in a bigger organization, those skills are more, um, are more readily available. But, um, you know, I, I don't, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, Ron, I'm not, a, I'm not a basketball player, but, but I certainly think, I certainly didn't want to position the company secretary as this, as this very, this, this high, uh, well, high or tall was only sort of basketball thing I could think of to say in response, in response to, to your metaphor. But, but I think, I think the reality is what I'm trying to point out is that, you know, again, it's not about being a particular kind of professional you can have within any organization, whether it be a complex one, a simple one, uh, an, a, a charitable organization, you need somebody who actually, it's common sense. At the end of the day, governance is not rocket science. Um, it, it really is about common sense and going with your gut feeling and knowing when to do the right thing. So I think as the role evolves, I don't want to put it on a pedestal that it's this hard thing to attain. I think it's about professional people from whatever profession they might come from, but actually looking to do the right thing um, with, with, within their particular context. Thank you, Lauren. So starting with the questions from our audience, the first one here that, that, uh, that uh, I think is very interesting is to talk about considering the complexity of the role. Do you think that this position can be outsourced as Charles pointed out? Can be outsourced? Do it, it make sense to you to outsource that strategic position? It directed to someone or it's open to <laughs> all of us? No, no. first to Laura. Then Lauren. you can jump in. Then you can jump in. And, and, and take care with conflict of interest. <laughs> so, so I think, so my initial comments would be needs must. So if I rather outsource than nothing, but I would say it's probably, from my perspective, I think it's probably easier to outsource the company secretary role, but not the corporate governance role. Um, I think it would have to be very carefully structured for 
I think the corporate, I think the the value in a corporate governance officer is somebody who is intimately involved with the company, who understands it and understands um, the strategic objectives, the nuances behind it, the challenges it faces. And if you can achieve that through outsourcing, by all means, but I would suggest, uh, I would suggest um, that would be difficult to achieve. Okay, and, and Lauren, a second question, and then I will pass the, 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 to you, to you, George. If, in, in the case, uh, considering your answer, how to recruit, probably to, to a person who knows the company very, very well, who do understand the business. So probably inside recruitment or outside, you see? Um. I don't think you have to have grown up in a company to be able to, if you've got the right person, they can come into a company. If they've got the right skills, those skills are transferable. So it's not, I don't think you necessarily have to have grown up in a company to be the person who can fulfill the corporate governance officer role. Um, I think that if you've got the right skills, the right attributes, um, you can you can move you can move into a new entity, learn and understand how it operates it and learn that quite quickly. Okay, George. No, my comment was that if you if you think it's outsourced, uh, it's not strategic to you, right? So if you need this position to be a strategic and you have this as, as a name, uh, probably you have to have you know uh, at home. You can outsource what is not core, uh, not exactly what is your core business, your you know, uh, advantages. Okay, in, in in the market in, in, in this, all these aspects. And Charles, yeah, no, I, and and uh, I I couldn't agree more. In terms of ulcers, I I I only see a value uh, to to make a good start. Let's say if you don't have anything and you don't have any history, having someone from outside helping you to organize the role, start the role. And then being a timely uh, uh, job, I agree. So otherwise, I will concur completely with George and, and with Lauren. And in terms of hiring, let me be a little bit more provocative here. I I I maybe would be fifty one percent on the side of having someone from outside uh, uh, in, instead of inside recruiting. And, and let me tell you why. And, and I'm not saying that inside recruiting doesn't work. I think the outside can bring you fresh and new perspectives. And depending on the knowledge of this person of the market, will bring you much more value than someone from inside that will still have the inside experience. Uh, and please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that inside recruiting doesn't work, but I would say that uh, there is a very, very important plus point the point here that is uh, uh, bringing someone with uh, a market knowledge with different perspectives uh, is, is also uh, very important to consider. Okay. Uh, Lauren, another question here is about the chemistry between the, the chairman of the board, the officer, the governance officer, and the CEO. This is a complex issue. Do you agree? I agree. I can tell you. I mean, <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think. I think. Um, I, I think chemistry is key. The fact. The fact. You can. You can. Chemistry is naturally there in, in some relationships, and in others, you've got to work harder at it. Um, and then sometimes, in some instances, you lose the chemistry because you might end up in a situation where you're not necessarily giving the message that the other party wants to hear. Um, but I do think, and I, and that's why I think the the um, the actual personality traits are also quite important because the company secretary is somebody who, it, they can't be the volatile person in the room. They, they need to be the one who manages those relationships, um, you know, relationships with the chairman because that's a key role that they play. And as I said before in my remarks, I think it's also quite key that the role that the company secretary or corporate governance officer plays in relation to, to the chief executive. Um, so those are both very, very 
critical relationships that need to be developed. And and sometimes, you know, you've also got sparks between the chairman and chief executive. So the, it's not unusual for the company secretary to find themselves in the middle of a relationship where there isn't chemistry between the chairman and, and, and the chief executive. So it, it's definitely about stakeholder relationship management. So so the question related to the, that, that one is, who is going to hire this officer, the chairman of the board, the CEO? So... Who has the last? The last. Uh, I think the primary. Know. I think I think the primary decision maker is, is the chairman. I, I think I think it's important that you know there's um, other board members are also potentially involved in the hiring as well. Yeah, I don't think they, they, it would depend on the organisation itself, but I think it's quite key. I think that role is is the chairman's. So and, and the relationship between this officer to the to, to the head of the law law department to the head of compliance officer to the head of external audit internal audit. so many many relationships and uh, with no subordination so uh, it's it's, yes. it's th this is really complex it's a very complex role because it has to navigate between all those those officers and and it's not easy it is a complex role and, and you know, we talk, I talk in, in my remarks about what is potentially an ideal world um, where, you know, you've got somebody who's correctly positioned, they've got all these characteristics, they're able to deliver on the strategy. Um, it isn't always like that. And, and I think I think what is key, and then this talks to the, the character of the individual that you're hiring is, is there something called sapiential authority, which is the ability to manage upwards. So to man manage those people who are more senior to you. And that's often something that a company secretary has to do or corporate governance officer, because often in an organization, they aren't positioned necessarily at the right place around the table, but it's their ability to engage, to build those relationships and try and influence behavior um, across the board to get to the right outcomes. In the case of corporations, of true corporations, very complex organizations, talking about compensation, the compensation level of disposition in relation to board members and the C-level. So I, I don't think, um, I mean, I, I don't, compensation is obviously an issue. They need to be correctly compensated, but I think that the market will find it's comfortable it's comfortable level around seniority. I think even within corporate governances across complex organizations, you'll find varieties in, in, in remuneration. But obviously if you're hiring the person at the right strategic level, you will need to compensate that person accordingly. So let me see, uh, Charles and, and, and George, be free to jump in if you, you need to make any comment or any questions. I'm, I'm just reading here the questions. So there are several questions here related to the evaluation of the board. So uh, the role of the GO in the evaluation of the pairs. This is tricky too. Should I comment or do you want George to comment? Go, go, you, go you first, Lauren, then George and, and Charles will jump in, okay? So I, th I think the corporate governance officer ha has, if, they, if you have a true corporate governance officer, they have a key role to play. One in selecting, helping the chairman and the board, whichever committee might be selecting, the person who's going to do the evaluation. It's key to understand when you're doing a board evaluation, what you want to get out of it, what your objective is, um, and then selecting a partner who can help you to, to deliver that, a partner um, who might do the evaluation for you. Um, I think in this regard, it's important the company secretary corporate governance officer plays a very important role in helping the chairman and that committee who may be running it to, to, to scope it and, and to set that scope. But then the role I think becomes an independent one where it then becomes up to the person you've got who's facilitating the review to run the review. And then the governance officer has a role then in taking what the outcome of that is and helping to convert that into actions, what might need to be done and following those actions through to make sure that whatever your objective was in the evaluation, you're then able to turn that into improvements in the way you operate as, as a board. Yeah, I, I would say that maybe you know, the, the most relevant you know, contribution of, uh, from the TGO is actually what, what Lawrence said last, because 
and we perceive this you know, uh, in, in our activities. We, the, the boards have you know, a very good diagnosis, a very good assessment, but sometimes there is no, I'd say, structured you know, uh, action plan to pursue improvements. So it, it's a kind of chaotic. I think the governing officer would, you know, has, has a role here in assure some discipline in terms of establish the priorities and actually to to assure the board is evolving right in, in addressing the the the, the, the main uh, relevant the most relevant issues identified during the, the evaluation. Charles, no, just just agreeing and and uh, I think the the uh, governance officer has an important role in that, assuring that the process is well executed. Okay, so uh, many, many questions here are, are in relation to, for instance, the role of this person with the shareholders. This, this, can you talk a little bit more about that directly with the shareholders, not the other stakeholders, with the shareholders in particular? So, so I think um, depending on your organization and what your shareholder body looks like, I think there is an important role. I mean, in a large organization, you might have a whole department um, in, in an investor relations department that's dedicated to that. If you are um, in a complex organization, the, I would suggest the corporate governance officer works closely with the investor relations department who are often focused on institutional rather than retail shareholders. But I think um, in any event, in both circumstances, the corporate governance officer has a role to play in the engagement of the entity with with those shareholders, understanding, you know, what their thinking is, what their concerns are about the entity, and making sure we're relevant that that is conveyed to the board. So the board are not operating in a vacuum, and they understand what the investors and shareholders are, are saying, feeling, and their expectations for the company. So I do think the corporate governance officer has an important part mm -hmm. to play in in that. And uh, I have one question here, Lauren. Considering the full the this this person, this governance officer, uh, in in the case of Great Britain, for instance, do you have many of them actually working with the full role role of, as you described in your paper, the polymath? I would say yes. I mean, I think I think in larger organizations, as I said, it's it's sort of almost. Conversely, uh, the converse case that in, in big organizations, obviously the, the breadth of, of what is done by an individual in the corporate governance officer role is might be limited, but certainly the knowledge and awareness, I think, is still there. Um, I think there is an acceptance. I think the way um, the way the role is positioned, even when it was just the, the you know, just consider company secretary before it became popular to start adding on even a corporate governance officer role title to it. I think there's an acceptance of the broader role. Um, that can be played, the important strategic role that is played, and um, the criticality of the ability of this person to add value in pushing forward an effective governance framework within an organisation. So I do, I do think yes, I, I, I don't think um, I don't think it's a unique role. I, I think it's fairly common. And uh, you think it's common not only in Great Britain, but you said that in Europe, in the United States, Canada, the developed countries in general, they have this. So, so I think it's there, but I think in many countries, in many organizations, even within a country, it'll be in states of, there'll be still still be states of evolution. So, I, I, you know, I don't want to give the impression that, it, you know, in every UK company, there's a forward looking view on what a corporate governance officer should do. I expect that you will find some organizations where there may be resistance still. It depends on the structure of the organization, but but certainly in premium listed companies, I think it's a very well known concept. But I would suggest in other jurisdictions, even where there is the concept of corporate governance officer, there's still challenges. It comes down to personal relationships as well. As you said, chemistry between people, how an organization structured, how important it takes governance. All of these things I think are, are important as to whether the role is successful or not. But I think there is a drive and there's a distinct move you can see towards the importance of the role um, and what it can play. You know, there are numerous studies around the importance of good governance and the value it creates. I alluded to um, through the, the crisis, people with good ESG 
um, policies doing faring better. And I, I think the same can probably be said for years now around, you know, empirical studies around good governance and performance of companies. And I think that as companies accept that, I think the importance, I think the, the importance of the role and the need for it is become self-evident almost. And not to say that everybody's sold yet, but it is, it's a battle, but one that's, I definitely think it's a journey, I should say, and definitely one that is, is worth going on. Well, well, guys, we are running out of time. So for last remarks for, for Charles, for George, and then Lauren. We can start with Charles. No, th thank you very much, Sharon. And, and, and of course, I want to thank you for the opportunity, for the invitation. This was a very great uh, exchange of ideas here. And maybe a final remark, uh, 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 Aaron, and, and this is our responsibility in the community of uh, uh, corporate governance is really, I think we are a little bit far away from having uh, the, the first, the, the recognition of this role and then the, the readiness of professionals uh, to do it. I, I do believe we have a lot of very, very good people that get, can take over this role. But maybe uh, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that we have is really having a bench of people prepared to, to assume a role like this. And uh, I'm sure that having good people we will have the place to go. So thank you very much for the opportunity. George. No, I, I appreciate the opportunity to actually to, to, to share the, the ideas and to hear actually from, from others. Uh, well, my final remark is actually this, uh, I think this would be uh, another you know, movement, you know, driven by IBGC in, in order to actually to accelerate the, the movement of improvement uh, of our governance in, in Brazil. And I think this is both, I think the responsibility for everybody that is actually assuming this role will increase. And I think the challenge here is actually to uh, create the awareness of the importance of this role uh, in, in, into the companies, into the boards, among the board members. And I think the IBGC has a role here in terms of actually to widespread this, uh, these aspects uh, among all the, you know, uh, the members of the Institute. And actually to prepare people in order to you know, take charge of such responsibilities. So this is not easy. This is not something that will not be, be made you know, quickly, but it's something that we, we, we need actually to, actually to, 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 to aim you know, for the near future. So again, thank you. And I, I hope you know, that we have success in this journey. Lauren? Thank you, Aaron. Um, I think in conclusion, I, I would just like to refer to my earlier remarks. I, I think that I think that real change doesn't necessarily happen overnight, especially with something as complex as this. And I think I think it's making it's taking those initial steps, it's taking small steps, um, baby steps, but eventually getting there. And I, and I think that's how the approach should be. I think introduction of a profession like this won't won't happen overnight. I think it will be evolutionary and but I think it's just getting started and you don't necessarily need to have those professionals ready and good to go. It's just about how you change practices um, through what you're doing now, through education, through ongoing communication with people, but encouraging the practice of, of good governance and, and hopefully thereby promoting the role of the, good, of the governance officer. So um, I want to congratulate RBGC on, 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 on taking this really good step um, and and also thank you to, for having me and I've really thoroughly enjoyed being part of this panel. Obrigado. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so thank you so much, Lauren, George, Charles. It was a wonderful panel. It's a pleasure being with you here. Thank you so much to our audience. Hope to see you in the, our next Connector. Okay, so you will know, know about it very soon. And uh, as everybody said here, uh, we are in a marathon. It's not a speed race. So, so we are step by step. And, and our purpose here at IBGC is a better governance for a better society. And I think it's worth look, fighting for it. Thank you so much to everybody. So we, we are done here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.